Okay, so this is a, um, a presentation about a catapult that we made for a science project at KNES, um, Kuwait National English School. Right, so I'm calling it the catapult of doom. We started off with uh, a rough idea of what we wanted to produce. We made a small scale model and played firing bits of paper across the room. Uh, we then um, designed and created a 3D model in a piece of CAD software, a free piece of CAD software, Google SketchUp. Thank you very much, Google. Google. Um, we messed this and uh, thought about it and uh, came up with our final design, which we then constructed and took to a competition, which unfortunately we didn't win, but uh, we certainly put on a good show. Okay, so this is our team. This is, uh, as at the beginning, Natalie, Shahad, and Rashid. And uh, here they are. Natalie, Shahad, Rashid, and me, Kamal. Okay, so we we started from scratch. We built this thing from timbers we bought locally, um, bolted them together, and uh, followed the plan which we'd uh, designed in the CAD. And uh, first day's progress, we got to something like this. And then a couple more weekends later, we um, we moved on to other components, and we have some rollers here to reduce friction, which the elastics go over, and so on. And uh, and finally painting the, uh, the catapult. Right, I'm just putting together this video to explain the design behind this catapult and hopefully explain some key physics concepts like work, kinetic energy and uh, vectors. So basically this catapult is uh, like the toys you make to fire paper across the room in the classroom. I'm sure you've had a go at that. And the idea is, is that um, we can build up a huge amount of stored energy in these elastics which are going to be stretched over this way. So this is a crude uh, release mechanism. It's just a pin I'm going to pull, which will allow this carabiner to fly, well, not to fly free, hopefully, but uh, close enough. So uh, you can just zoom in down here. This is the release mechanism. And this is the release mechanism. When you pull this, this is under tension. This can move freely up there. OK, so let's load up the catapult and explain some of the concepts behind what's going on. Okay, so I've, I'm going to stretch this piece of elastic and in doing so, I'm doing work on the elastic. Work is force times distance. And as you can see, I'm applying a force through a distance on this elastic. And I'll do this several times with several pieces of elastic, building up more and more strain and stored. Okay, so there's a couple of elastics. Uh, if I get my Newton meter, I can measure the amount of strain energy stored so if I stretch this piece of elastic back, as you can see I had to do some work on it. The final force required to stretch this elastic, I'm going to find out now. So this is calibrated in newtons. Okay, and the reading is... Okay, so I've done some work on this elastic and I'm stretching it, putting it in here. I'm going to repeat this process over and over again, storing more and more energy each time. It's a little bit tricky. I need someone here to help me, really. Okay, just get these slightly untangled. Okay, and again, more and more stray energy is being stored. It's just a done set. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. I can always cut and edit this later. I know. Oh, 
It's hard work. It's been worth being forced down to distance. It's a lot of strain energy being stored, which, when the catapult is fired, will all convert, hopefully, not all probably because of some losses, but a lot of it will convert into kinetic energy, which can be described by the equation half mv squared. And if I know the amount of energy going into the projectile, I can know the final velocity, because the equation half mv squared, I know the mass of the projectile, and uh, I know the energy, so I can rearrange that to find the final velocity. So how many am I on now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll go for twelve. Remember doing twelve. Four twelve was a fair amount of whack. Can't do two at a time. Too hard. Okay, so this is at about 10% strength. We've got, well, maybe 20% strength because we have the potential to put about 70 bands on here. And at the moment there are 12. So let's see what 12 looks like. Okay, I think we need to find 25%. So we'll see it go. Okay, this is a, the projectile. It does actually weigh around about one kilo. Okay, look at it in there. Okay, try and get it central as much as possible. Okay, now we're ready for release. This will be a good one. Okay, that's good. So we will clear it. Okay, you ready, Ruth? Mm-hmm. All right, so now all that's needed is a fast, sharp pull. And all the work I've just done in stretching that last I have to wait till this person's gone. So all the work I've just done in stretching this elastic is now stored as elastic potential energy. I know that number in joules, I can then equate that to kinetic energy half mv squared and rearrange the equation knowing the mass of this for final velocity, which will be a vector, and I'll be able to calculate from that vector the vertical component of velocity and the horizontal component of velocity. This thing is at 45 degrees, which makes things a lot easier. Okay, I think we're clear. So, five, four, three, two, one, pull. And that is a nice shot. <laughs> yes. Shall so stop. Twelve is exactly the limit at which I think it becomes dangerous in the school playground. Okay, yes, I'm going to go get that now. Shall I stop it? Yeah. Right. So this is at uh, about 20% power on the countdown, 3, 2, 1, and the fire. Okay. I believe the design of the catapult is a good design because um, we can we can do an almost well not an infinite amount but we can do a hell of a lot of work on that elastic and that work is going to be our store of energy. The more energy we have stored, the more energy there is to be converted into kinetic energy. The more kinetic energy the object has, the greater its velocity. If we know the velocity of uh, or the velocity at release of the projectile and we know the angle it's being fired at, which is 45 degrees. We can take that velocity vector, resolve it into the vertical and the horizontal uh, components. The vertical co component um, can tell us the time uh, the projectile was in the air for, and the horizontal comp component, uh, as well as that time, will tell us the distance that the projectile can travel, or the range of the projectile. So let's get straight into the calculations. Okay, How much work is done in stretching the elastic? 
Well, conventionally, or with normal sort of simpler problems, which you might meet in the GCSE, you have uh, an object being pushed or pushed up a hill or something uh, against a, a known force. So let's just say we have a block of wood or something, and we're going to push it along the floor 10 meters. And in doing this, by applying a force through a distance, we are doing work. The definition of work in physics is force multiplied by distance. So the amount of work done here, if we got the block to be here, by you know, if we push the block to here, uh, the work would have been 10 times 10, which is 100 joules. If we put this on the graph, 10 newtons, 10 meters, it would have been a constant force, and uh, you'd plot a graph out like this. In fact, this number here is in fact the area underneath here. Now, why is this significant? It's significant because we, um, when I was stretching the elastic on the catapult, so if we look top down on the catapult, the elastic sits here, okay, and it's pulled down here, and it gets stretched into this kind of a shape by a, a force here. Okay, in fact, I measured this force, and I found that that force was 250 newtons. And this distance from here to here is 1.2 meters. Okay, right. But the problem is, is that as you start, when you start stretching the elastic, like when you're up here, the force isn't 250 newtons, it's much smaller. And then here it gets bigger and gets bigger and gets bigger until it reaches its maximum force. Um, so we have to bear this in mind when we calculate the work done on the elastic. Um, if I assume that the elastic obeys Hooke's law and it's the force with which it um, tries to stop you extending it is proportional to the extension or the distance to which I've just moved it in this case, then I can just uh, draw a straight line graph for this. I can say that force was getting larger as the extension was getting larger. Since I know the final force was 250 newtons, and I know that the extension was 1.2 meters, finding the area under here is just as easy as finding the area of a triangle. Uh, in the last example, it was a rectangle, and I just did 250. I would have just done uh, the height multiplied by the base. In this example, it's half the area of a rectangle. So I'm going to do 250 the height, multiplied by 1.2 the base, and then divide it by 2, because it could have been a whole rectangle, as you can see. And if it's half the rectangle, that's half the area. Calculating 250 multiplied by 1.2 divided by 2 gives me 150 joules of energy. So each piece of latex that was being stretched stored 150 joules of energy. Now, how much kinetic energy will we have in the end for each piece of elastic? If I work on the assumption that about 30% of the energy is wasted as heat, um, I don't know, uh, kickback on the catapult and various other, uh, like heating of the elastics and friction in the bearings, um, maybe probably quite a bit more than that was wasted. Um, but if we just start, just for the sake of argument, we'll say it was about 30%. That means of my 150 joules, only about 0.7 of that will be available to be converted into kinetic energy. This gives me a energy value of about 105 joules. Let me write that, 105 joules. Okay. So what will the initial velocity of my projectile be? Right, we have to take the kinetic energy equation. Half mv squared. In fact, I'm going to write it as mv squared over 2, which is the same. Is equal to kinetic energy. Right, if I want to rearrange this for velocity, I have to multiply kinetic energy by 2 getting rid of it on, you know, if I multiply it on both sides by 2, that gets the KE over there. So now I've got mv squared is equal to k dot e multiplied by 2, and then dividing both sides by m cancels the m's out on this side. I've got v squared is equal to ke2 over m, and then if I take the root of both sides, this root cancels. We've got v is equal to the root of ke multiplied by 2 divided by the mass. What are my numbers? Well, if I assume the energy from here, then it's going to be V is equal to the root of 105 um, 
multiplied by 2 divided by the mass, it's a 1 kilogram mass, and this gives me the answer of, right, I'm going to cheat because I've forgotten to write this bit down, 14 meters per second. Okay, I used a spreadsheet to calculate these actually, so, um, and with the spreadsheet I found the uh, final velocity, or sorry, the release velocity for 1 band, 20 bands, 40 bands, 60 bands, and I'm going to do the calculation now as though we're going to use 60 bands. Actually, in testing, we never managed to use 60 bands because it had fired it right out of the school. And on competition day, um, we didn't have the nerve to try it just in case we had issues with releasing the mechanism. So it's never been tested at full force. But, theoretically anyway, if we had fired with 60 bands, we would have had 630 joules of energy. Uh, sorry, 6,300 joules of energy which would have given us a release velocity of 112 meters per second. So this makes this vector 112 meters per second at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal, and of course that means it's 45 degrees to this side as well. Okay, so now we're going into the vectors part of the uh, problem. Now, using a bit of trigonometry, which I'm not going to explain, um, I can uh, I can find the value of this vector and the value of this vector, and they're both going to be the same. So it doesn't matter which one I find first, they're both going to be equal because it, this is 45 degrees, which is dead in the center of 90 degrees. So if I start with a uh, velocity of 112 meters per second, sine 45 will give me one of those vectors. And that comes out to, on my calculator, 79.19, I'll write that down, that's 79 meters per second, okay? So I'm saying that this is 79 meters per second, and this is 79 meters per second. The verti vertical velocity, if you looked at it separately on its own, just looked at how the projectile moved in the vertical plane, it would be as though it started out at 79 meters per second. Right, so the next part is I need to find how long the thing was in the air. If I know that it went up and then down right and it started out here at 79 meters per second then at this point here the speed is going to be 0 meters per second so I actually know that the change in velocity for this time period is going to be 79 meters per second that's what's changed, it's gone from 79 meters per second to 0 meters per second okay So, let's move on. What else do I know? I know the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. The acceleration due to gravity on Earth, sorry, it's usually a little way, is 9.81 meters per second squared. So I can use uh, the acceleration formula, A is equal to delta V over T. I can rearrange it for T. T is going to be equal to... Um, T is equal to V divided by A. And now substitute the numbers in. 79 divided by 9.81. And on my calculator, that's coming out as, as close as possible to 8 seconds. Just rounding, up, rounding down a bit there. So uh, the time period is 8 seconds. Uh, that's the time period to go from 79 meters per second to 0 meters per second. Now, the actual time it took will be twice that, because it's going to go from 79 meters per second to zero meters per second, and then fall back down again. If there was no air resistance, it would take the same amount of time to go up as it would to do down to go back down again, because it would be uh, a graph like uh, maybe like this, and we'd have initial velocity of 79 meters per second here, and negative 79 meters per second because it's a vector, and you'd have something like so, something like this, okay, and. Uh, the gradient of the graph would be constant throughout. So that 8 is going to be 16 because it's twice twice this uh, this time. Okay, so just find my the calculation. So we're uh, we're just basically doing a velocity is equal to distance divided by time, rearranging this equation for distance. So that would be distance is equal to velocity multiplied by time. 
Our velocity is equal to 79 meters per second, and since it takes 8 seconds to go from 79 meters per second to 0 meters per second at the top, it will take another 8 seconds to come back down again, so I'm going to say that the time period is in fact 2 times 8 meters per second. Calculating all this out gives us 1.26 kilometers, which is a very large distance for a catapult that was made for about 150 pounds sterling. Okay, how realistic this is, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to test because um, the, mis the actual catapult itself may not be able to withstand that much strain energy and uh, could pull itself to pieces. But in testing, we have definitely fired 100 meters and that is pretty satisfactory to me. Okay, so this devastating monster, when it's firing with 12 bands of elastic, you can see the effect. If I was to put on the rest, there's 40 more bands on this, which could then each individually be stretched, um, and then there is another, uh, maybe 20, um, another 10 here. We get to the point where we've got around about 75 individual bands being stretched. If we know the energy stored in each of those individual bands, we can calculate the final velocity. The, the uh, design considerations of this is, if you can come over here and look at this point, the release mechanism is absolutely vital. In fact, we had quite a crude release mechanism. I, I, re um, I regret not coming up with something a bit more sturdy and able to release under higher tension. Uh, because I found that when we got up to about 20 elastics, you had to be pretty strong to pull this and make it release if it was uh, under the whole weight, which we never tried, the whole 75 bands, it's possible that the force would have been great enough to actually pull this pin, this uh, latch, out of the whole the piece of wood and torn it to shreds. And so I think you'd have to start looking at welding and steel designs in order to be able to fire this thing full force and a levered mechanism to uh, release this thing. So you're pulling like this and working with a lever, which you could probably smack with a hammer or something and, and get a nice fast release. Or you could use a, um, a pelican hook or something like that, but that would be specialized equipment and more expensive. Okay. Yeah? Is that stop? All good. Yes.